This is also one I really want to do, so let's hope this one goes well as well. So here we go. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to DL Live. This is a daily stream in which we talk about design. I used to do a video, a YouTube video series called Design Over Time. Uh, that had a lot of production. It took most of the day to get that done, but now I'm doing something a little bit less time intensive uh, because now I have a job as a, a game designer at an actual studio. So I only have so much free time, but I still want to be giving you guys content every day if I can. So this is what I'm doing. Uh, you can find us on YouTube at Design Oriented, our Twitter is at Design Oriented, our Discord link is in the Twitter, and, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, so join us if you are interested in game design, because we really do talk about this kind of stuff all the time, to this level of depth and beyond. Oh, uh, check it out. Your random fact for the day is I have a degree in creative writing, but that doesn't really make sense because we're not doing the story one. That was supposed to be a, a, a tie-in, a, a lead-in. Let's just click that and get rid of that. Uh, we're not talking about story, we're talking about action core. So let's click over to our notes about the action base. Yay. Okay, so we're really talking about the root of action, but I like to say the word core, so I'm going to change it live. Uh, and we're talking about um, what makes up action. And because we're starting off pretty general like this, uh, what we're talking about should apply to you know, TV shows, uh, martial arts films, video games, uh, how you appreciate sports, so many things uh, are common. Like, we're all starting off in this common core, that's why I called it the core in the first place. So, uh, I think I said before in another stream, but I'll reiterate it. One of the most important things to realize is that uh, what we consider to be action, which is just meaningful, uh, you know, how are we going to define that? As far as stories and video games and, and, and stuff like that goes, we're looking for uh, meaningful interactions that happen due to objects or characters or things, um, you know, affecting each other in the real world. Or another way to say that is they're in some kind of location, some kind of setting, some kind of space, and objects are affecting each other. That's pretty as, as general as it gets, but this pretty much rolls out things like um, concepts, this rules out things like, you know, figurative language and stylistic approaches. We're really trying to get as concrete as possible when we're talking about action. And I think that's one of the most important first things to realize. Like, action is really simple. That's why it's kind of hard to define, uh, because it's really concrete. And just about everything we do in our daily lives, it's made up of, um, small actions. We do things in, in our time. daily lives. Oops. It's made up of, stop that. Uh, it's made up of small actions and these kinds of things add up over time. We have our daily routine. Uh, we go to the same places where we go to work. And so much of what we do involves uh, doing things in the world and having that affect us. So let me pop this chat out because I forgot to do that. So the core of action really involves things being in some kind of space. And we kind of know that via proximity lots of interesting or not interesting things happen like when you put fire next to a stick of dynamite like that's a lot more potentially interesting or interesting or dangerous or explosive than it is if you put those two things not in the same space and so much of what we sort of how we get by in real life we've learned to intuit and understand things happening in space so it's really important to realize that positioning the the relative distances of objects and, and, and actions to each other is really the core of action. So it's not really about how fast and how fancy your kicks are, how cool your punches are, how, how crazy of a laser gun you have, or what the space battles look like, or how many missiles get shot. It really is, everything is set on a firm foundation of objects being carefully positioned in space. Cause that's like 90% of what we're talking about here. If you mess that up, pretty much everything else just kinda uh, goes downhill from there. So, yeah, one of my, oh, it's gone. Yep, it's down here. One of my favorite ways to illustrate this point is talking about Pac-Man. And um, Pac-Man's a classic video game, and it's a game where just with movement alone, you pretty much have this really interesting, uh, not infinitely replayable, but pretty much for considering how much people are going to actually dig into the game and play it, uh, you got this little action game. And we can look at Pac-Man to really help us understand uh, 
what the core is of this action gameplay. So if you go to the DO blog, I know the links are a little bit broken and it doesn't work uh, as smoothly as we would hope. But if you type in the search that you could find somewhere, uh, Pac-Man, you'll get some articles that I wrote back in 2015. Uh, variables of difficulty, Pac-Man design, deterministic and random ghost. Uh, Pac-Man design hallways turns level analysis and Pac-Man design what's interesting about Pac-Man's gameplay. You know, this one's the first article. And if we click on it, you can see the DO color coding uh, showing up in full force. Let me just go ahead and disable this for an hour. <coughs> so as you can see, the DO color coding here in full force. I don't know if that actually made um, the this, this stream go from like a yellowish tint to a white tint. You'll have to let me know because I have this thing on my desktop that takes away this harsh blue white lighting the later it gets in the evening so that you know my sleeping schedule doesn't get all messed up but anyway this article has a nice red band here for enemy design a light blue band here for systems and rules and this purple band here for modes and features that should be modes and features maybe it's uh and then i i kind of explain it here so you can read this on your own time but essentially here's a little cool gif of pac-man running around and this guy playing a really effective um, strategy and just showing you turn by turn what you should do. Talks a little bit about Ghost AI uh, and Pac-Man runs around and think cool things happen. But one thing to note is Pac-Man all you do is have up down left right and with just up down left right and moving around this environment uh, the majority of your actions play out with just uh, movement. So. You know, you can get cornered, you can get pinched, you can get trapped, you can juke, you can teleport, you can uh, dance in a hallway to get people to sort of aggro to you and kind of uh, follow you down one hallway versus another. You can do so much with just movement and all these different sort of what I call scenarios happen because of Pac-Man's excellent design. So you can look at a lot more games that have a lot more complexities and games that are supposed to be brawlers or combat focused and you can kind of in a really simple way get a sense of how diverse their action is by considering how many different scenarios that play out uh, when you're playing so you know you could beat up the guys on the screen all day but the the method that you do that is really important you can watch any Jackie Chan film and it's not just the fact that he wins the fights that we find him so entertaining it's that he does it in such a sort of creative and free-flowing and and uh, reactive style that like anything he does is just super engaging and super comical and then all, all the moves that he does you can like read the expression on his face and you can see the ideas he's going for and you can see when he hurts himself because he does his own stunts and the pain on his face is real so um, I say all that to say that action is spatial based positioning is everything and the like the third important takeaway here is that um, the clarity in which you convey these really simple core things is the third most important thing when trying to understand action. So Pac-Man is a top-down game. You see everything. There's nothing that happens on the screen that is like hidden or obscured by some 3D geometry or whatever. And that's what I love about non-scrolling single-screen games. You can see everything. And uh, it just really makes a good use of your peripheral vision and the fact that everything's sort of static as far as the level arrangement you can see so much happening out of the corner of your eye and know for a fact like exactly where ghost positions are um, every dot that you eat in Pac-Man is clearly visible and that's just a really highly effective sort of gameplay challenge and with its own built-in feedback so you always know like where's my last dot instead of ever being confused and if you think that's something trivial I played a lot of games where you do like eight out of the nine things they want you to do and all of a sudden you lose track of which ones you've done and where you've been and it's kind of a nightmare to go back over your steps so this is not trivial at all um, the reason Pac-Man works is because you can see everything and because what you've done um, is clear your objective is clear how much you need to do is clear how much it, you risk doing any one action is clear like when you right there when you made that turn and dodged the green and pink ghosts that's because the timing worked out, but that's not something the player has to guess. It's something you can see directly on the screen because everything's represented so well. So yeah, if you want to know more about Pac-Man, lots of cool articles here. Um, 
What is this one? It's, it's, I talked about mechanics here. This is the first article. Wow. <laughs> It was such a neat idea because this is when Google was doing their whole Pac-Man, turned the Google Maps into Pac-Man gameplay. Uh, so I took the opportunity to analyze what makes Pac-Man good and then see why these Google Map procedurally generated level designs are um, good or bad and how good or bad their controls are. So you know, just pretty much doing full gameplay analysis. And uh, this picture is with the DO color coding as you can see at the bottom of the, the stream screen yellows for level design so i outlined the level in yellow uh blue is mechanics so i outlined the path that uh pac-man can move in blue um this pink here is feedback so i have it showing the dots that pac-man has to eat as like a clear uh element of feedback light blue or red is enemy element so i drew a ghost in red i'm not sure why i did light blue here systems and rules maybe it was like ai or something uh, design space is this little area here, and I just tried to keep the color coding. That took me forever to do, so <laughs> I'm glad I got to at least show it one more time. Uh, and this one's an article about level design, so I, I count the number of four-way hallways, three-way hallways, and two-way, or like, you know, single-channel areas, and do an analysis on what the original Pac-Man level looks like and why it's so interesting. Here's your stats. Then I do an analysis of the Google logo that they turn into a Pac-Man level and see how different it looks and compare the numbers. And even though it looks like it's a decent setup, this layout is not very fun because you have these long stretches where there's no turning, no decision making, and you get trapped easily. And that just leads for a frustrating experience. And you would be surprised at how little you can change the, the original Pac-Man level and turn it from like it's great game into a frustrating experience. But I continue to analyze Google Map levels and play them and respond to them and that was a long project it was so fun pac-man is one of my favorite classic games and i play him in smash brothers and i play mario in smash brothers and this is half the reason why is because i did all these deep dives like this uh what is design space and enemy design uh, i talk about some of these little perfect routines that they have what are they called What do they call these things? Patterns? Whatever. So that's Pac-Man. Uh, let's get back to our notes here. Pac-Man's a big deal when you realize that you can get so many nail-biting, precisely controlled, skillful, strategic, and uh, gameplay scenarios out of just up, down, left, right. That should really give you an idea of, of you know, how much how little you need to add on top of that in order to create really interesting gameplay so thinking about pac-man is always a good idea and we started with that i think as far as pac-man style gameplay goes there really haven't been people innovating in that area uh i, I think um i mean as soon as you give people a gun they just want to make shooters and a lot of the st genres of gameplay that came about 15 20 years ago people have been iterating on and people want to build worlds and people want to build um exploration and people want to do all these other things and no one really just wants to go up down left right anymore so i feel like there's not a lot of games that in the pac-man spirit uh keep the action super clear super clean and 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 do it with so minimal amount of elements for player mechanics but one one such game is shoot your rocket uh you know you can see the the streamer down here you know i'm just showing a clip so hopefully everyone's okay with this and hopefully that music's not too loud hopefully you can hear it so this is choo choo rocket uh what the multiplayer looks like it's top down just like pac-man things go into their hallways uh everything moves straight so the movement is very simple the ai is very very simple Whenever a cat or a mouse, is that too loud? Whenever a cat or a mouse hits a uh, a wall, they always turn right. So everything has this little clockwise flow. You can see it immediately when I point it out clockwise. Everything's moving clockwise, and unless you put an arrow in the way. So this game is like four players at once. Each player gets three arrows that they can lay at maximum, and you can put these arrows in any direction, up, down, left, right, and you can see how you can. Some of the mice are funneled and you can cut off people's sort of 
uh, mouse taps <laughs> by cutting off their flow and making their flow go into your flow and and even though this is a lot faster paced and so a lot more chaotic because it's free for all you can play this two players and I just really feel like this game idea was just so well done I played this game on Dreamcast online that's <laughs> a long time ago when online play really wasn't a thing and we had to connect a phone line into the back of a weird Dreamcast attachment that we bought, like, uh, <laughs> the old days, but enjoy yourself some Choo Choo Rocket for a moment. Mmm, delicious. Okay, so the next game that I feel like keeps the spirit alive is Nintendo Land. Nintendo Land, they have a Mario Chase game. And even the Luigi's Mansion game too, it's not so less. Uh, Luigi's Mansion game to another degree, and even Mario, this is called Animal Crossing Sweet Days. It's a multiplayer game in which the gameplay player plays two cops, and then everyone else plays these little robbers, so to speak. And uh, candy. the more candies uh, you the eat, candy the slower you go, and the whole point is collectively as a group of robbers, you need to get, uh, what is it, 35 candies? in your mouth like running around with them and uh, the, uh, the cops just need to hit you three times as a team so it, all this game really is is up down left right like sure you have to hit a button to pick up the the um, the candy that drop out of the trees so it's not nearly as minimal as Pac-Man but the basic idea is the same like you create jukes you create traps there's risk reward the feedback is clear with the size of your head and the, the amount of candies that you're picking up and how slow you move and they really just try to um <laughs> it's really just a lot of fun interesting situations made out of just moving you can see on the bottom right screen there that frog barely got away and uh I think it's really interesting when you start thinking about the clarity in which action communicates, good clear action communicates what's happening. You should be able to watch a film uh, in a foreign language or look at a game that you've never seen before and as long as they create clear feedback and have clear action, you should be able to, you know, enjoy the tense moments just like the players uh, recognize and enjoy the tense moments. You be should be able to see an opportunity to come up just like the players see an opportunity to come up like right here big headed animal running to the left getting attacked has to spew out uh, candies and on the top left continuing to spew candies to run faster like you should be able to tell what's happening just based on uh, what's what's present on the screen because again that's what's at the top action is really simple and action should be positional based and space based and even though you may not know all the rules of the interactions if you stay true to what action is and you you respect that throughout your design most of it should should come across clearly you know a random story when we were taking bar body ball around to different conventions and having people play it uh, there's this one lady you know just just older woman not sure what she was doing at the anime convention just kind of hanging out but she was watching us demo the game for some other players and it was interesting because she just like sat there quietly nobody you know said anything she wasn't bothering anyone but then, like, I noticed that whenever we would all gasp because super um, tense and tight moments were happening in the game, she would also gasp. And she, like, nobody told her what the rules were, but she could she could tell what was happening. Like, oh, one character's trying to get the ball on one side and the other's trying to get the other, and they're playing tug-of-war, and, and that much was it's just incredibly clear to her. I'm like, well, I mean, that's just super cool. That's why I love about action and it's and it's, it's why I'm telling you this now because I learned these things firsthand and watching other people watch the things that I worked on and like oh like that is important and now it's important forever now I can tell you why it's important so that's Animal Crossing Sweet Days uh, I don't have any footage of Spear Tracks battle it's a battle mode for Legend of Zelda uh, Spear Tracks it's super good like super good I wish somebody would remake it and I wish I could play it more such a good battle mode so you just got to look that one up on yourself or if somebody one person has a game pack get yourself some friends use that ds download play feature and uh, enjoy that battle mode but that's another game that i feel like does a really good job of just all, all you pretty much do in that game is move links around and it's just a really cool competitive battle mode with uh these npc uh phantoms running around trying to kill all of you <laughs> basically 
So with that said, I wanted to just briefly touch on this idea that <clears throat> a lot of action genres are simple. Like, you're never going to get more simple, almost never going to get more simple than Pac-Man. Um, there are some WarioWare games that are just one button, right? And one action, and you do it like once, and then the game resets. So WarioWare is pretty much scraping the bottom of the complexity level there, but just going a little bit higher in the complexity. We have platformers, and up, down, left, right, sure, but now you have gravity typically, and you can jump. And racing games, I feel like, are really simple too. If you have your decent brake, a decent acceleration, and your left right turns, uh, as long as you simulate some kind of momentum or something close to that, you can have some really solid uh, racing game dynamics emerge out of those simple rules. And I think racing games are super cool for that reason. Shoot 'em ups are cool. You know, especially those vertical shoot 'em ups where it's just bullets on the screen and you're just moving around. And figuring out a way to shoot where you want to while staying alive. I feel like a lot of shoot 'em ups have moved far away from that simple core and just flooded the screens with bullets and, and power ups and just too much going on. I just don't think any of that adds too much to why I like these games in the first place. Uh, and they kind of move a little bit further away from the action core. So let's take a look at some platformers. Platformers are simple and. Um, like I said before, it really doesn't get much more simple than Leap Day and Super Mario Run. I'm so sorry, I left that off. I tried to stop her, sir. I got it, I got it, leave me alone. Okay, so, Leap Day is a game for iOS. I started playing it in January, shortly after Christmas. And it be easily became one of my favorite platformers. Let me see if I can even pull up my um, my classic. Oops. Where's my classic? Oops. Here it is. Uh, right here. Let's see how this works. Cool. Cool. What's, how's my RAM doing? How's the land, Master Fox? So, let's see. Leap Day. Highlighted in yellow because this would receive one of my Games of the Year awards uh, if I still wrote those blog posts. Action platformer. I put 22 hours into this iOS game. I started playing it. It just be just just before Christmas. So that's fun. And uh, I started taking video just after Christmas. And I, I perfected 84 of the levels in the game, but they have a level every day, so there's no way I'm going to play like 700 levels. Um, so let's go to rank by genre, platformer, you can barely see that. Yeah, that's fine. There we go. Platformer 2D Leap Day snuck its way into one like my fifth favorite platformer of all time. Uh, it's, so you know it's not all Super Mario Brothers. We got some Donkey Kong here, some Kirby, Rainbow Curse, and Leap Day. You know better than Meat Boy, Fly Range. I like it better than M Plus and Celeste. You know down here in ten uh, Sonic series, some of them Little Big Planet. You know Epic Yarn, Rayman VVD, all that. So, it's, I think it's really good, but let me show you and explain what I mean, so maybe you can get a better idea. I took these videos. With the iOS and the Switch, you can just take videos all the time of what you play. I just take so many videos. And I really want to showcase... What did I want to showcase? <laughs> Let's click this one. I really want to showcase... Um, the fact that even though this game's a one button iOS touch game, can you guys hear that? Well, I'm gonna lower the volume anyway. Even though this is an iOS game and it's one touch, and your character runs automatically, and there's no variable run speed, and all you get is a double jump, and there's no even pressure sensitive jumps, there's no variable height, it's just your character runs back and forth like this. If you jump, you slide down the walls like that. 
if you double jump, you know, you just double jump and that's all you get, but you reset your double jump after you touch a wall or the ground. Just with these, this simple setup, I wanted to show and explain just how diverse and complex and rich the platforming gameplay is um, because it just stays true to the action core, right? Just moving this dude through space and how to make that interesting and how to make that challenging and how to make, you know, 700 levels of varying uh, a variety to keep people interested. Yeah, I got squished right there. So this is one of the most interesting games I've ever seen that just takes one button. And um, it doesn't take too long to get used to his controls and his speed and the angle at which he jumps. But you think with these limitations as far as being able to control where, where like how you move up horizontally, uh, being not being able to control your jump height unless you double jump. You think with all these limitations, this game would be super linear. Like you have to jump this way, you have to to do it with this timing, you have to blah blah blah. But the reason why I like this game is it's surprisingly, surprisingly non-linear and in multiple ways. One, you can tackle some of these challenges with multiple timings, multiple angles, general multiple strategies. Um, but the second thing is, if you mess up halfway, like the, what I'm doing here, you know, it, you don't just die from your mistakes instantly. Um, the hazards are fairly conservative. The, they look like Mario hazards, like right, right here, they look like fireballs, and you know that's a good sign where you try to make, just like what we saw in Pac-Man, you try to make your, your hazards and your, um, your pickups super clear so that the stakes and the conditions on which you are building your action scenes out of are also super clear and that just makes the whole experience more interesting um more dramatically interesting not just like interesting as far as interesting choices go uh, but dramatically interesting and fair and, and it just puts a lot of stress off of certain bad aspects of your game like fighting the game you're never going to fight the game um so yeah, everything you see on the screen, this this game does have like minor camera problems, but I don't think you're going to see any examples of it here. Um, but yeah, stuff like this even has enemies like Mario style where, you know, they react to your proximity and you can jump on them and dodge the projectiles and choose to either just get the fruits for the bonuses or kill the enemies to get by. And the fruits that's what it means to 100% the level you get every single fruit and you have unlimited tries you always have unlimited tries to do all this per floor uh, or per per whatever so you're not too stressed either it's just pure gameplay challenge and none of the drawbacks of like you died reset your character or you don't have enough levels so you can't you know do your mega jump yet and <laughs> these flies are interesting I'll, I'll explain oops no right here These flies um, get triggered by your you walking underneath them or whatever, and then when they 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 drop from the ceiling and then they explode into these these grubs explode into flies and the flies always go to your position, so you I start to move in these unconventional ways in order to juke the flies basically. Um, interesting set of platforms here that you can jump up down in out of jump on top of enemies and get your kills. And then sometimes jumping on individual enemies is hard because of the angle. But then, you know, it's all about rebounding off the next wall and reconfiguring your angle. So, like, that's a lot of fun. That's Leap Day at its most basic. Uh, I took those videos. Now I'm just going to pick some random videos. This one. You can change your character. <laughs> Maybe I'll draw some diagrams. I don't, hopefully I don't need to draw diagrams. So this is a cool example of how the game has multiple timers going on and unlike a lot of hard indie games where they make their gameplay too linear, 
this is actually quite conservative for a complex timing challenge. And you can see you can use the little block in the middle to reset your jump. And if you're going after all the, um, oops, if you're going after all the fruit, you have an additional challenge of dealing with all this complexity. So let me see if I actually did I actually say that one. Here we go. This is uh, me with my second attempt. And whether you choose to slide down a platform, when you decide to jump, if you decide to double jump, which part you decide to slide down, like as you can see I'm threading the needle on a lot of these little interactions. Ah, oh, I died. <laughs> But those little playgrounds like that, um, non-linear playgrounds, remind me so much of what I love most about Mario. And what I found, so like some of the challenges in this game are more straightforward and you do have to do it more or less in a, in a small window. But some playgrounds like that just open up just like Super Mario Bros. 3 and you're just playing around with all the cool coolness. So let me sh just pick more random examples. It's because we have time and this is my show. Okay, so oh, this is this one's so cool. So those blocks require you to hit them with your head in order to even open them up a little. Uh, so this is a platform here that's not even threatening. So you can just get used to um, it moving slowly back and forth and um, learning how to break the bricks there. All right, it's showing it again. So that's gonna come up later. Let's see what this one looks like. And I have Google Photos, so it backs up my iOS videos automatically. This is what I'm looking at it on. It's just super convenient. I didn't upload any of these uh, directly. So that this is the kind of stuff I love. That window looks super tight, but it looks, for the most part, I want to say 98% of the challenges in this game are meticulously tuned to where there's tiny little gaps and tiny little possibilities that if you just sort of feel out the overall complexity of the timing challenge at hand, stuff like that. Like, and stuff, and you can go backwards up through it. It's like, wow, that's crazy. I thought it, it would definitely be a lot more strict than that. But the better I got at the game, the more I was able to see these holes, these possibilities, and just play around like in, with improvisation instead of with memorization. And I think it's a huge benefit to this game's, to this game's credit. So this is me showing you that this is a little bit of the tuning I was talking about. The spikes don't kill you if you walk underneath them. Uh, let's see. That's so, some of those tight windows are so tight, but it's so simple. Uh, the auto running kind of forces you to engage at certain timings in certain ways. And that's kind of why I like it a lot. Uh, so this is, this is what the ending of every level looks like. It has a checkerboard pattern. So look how, look how crazy some of these get. These enemies react to your horizontal position and they shoot a thingy and that guy in the top drops an egg uh, that could kill you. And then these are little Metroid style beetles. And whether or not you jump early or jump late because you see the threat coming in from the, from the top makes a big difference. Um, one of the, the deceptive things about action games is if they look simple, uh, they may not be just because, I mean just because you understand what's happening on the screen doesn't mean that when you play it you're gonna have all the knowledge and the reflexes, the timing, the foresight to sort of do it naturally and even though this challenge looks simple, this is actually a really hard one. The walls are rubber, so you can't wall jump off of them. So if you want to try to get these, uh, get up, you have to time it correctly. But then they put these platforms in this oscillating up and downness. So I'm like, how do I get up? And I was trying to figure it out. And then, yeah, I was trying to do, use it without the platform. And it was a little crazy right there. <laughs> and that's a little crazy as well. And that window was so tight, and then you have to jump there, and then you have to jump and jump on the fruit. I'm like, that was a neat combination. So I went down into it to see how how loose this challenge was and how flexible it could be. No, not too flexible on that one. Oh, not Mario yet. Let's go back. 
Let's pick some more random ones. This one. So, so the game, you know, has a whole bunch of different levels. You can see stuff like this is really interesting because normally when you play this part in a normal platformer, because you can control where your character goes, you're like, I'll just wait here for the next cycle. But the very fact that your character keeps jumping, you're like, you cannot wait for the next cycle. It actually propels you into making decisions um, faster and maybe at timings and positions that you don't want to. And sometimes that may feel like a cheap shot. But like I said before, the game's built around it, it's tuned around it, and you lose an opportunity in one pass, but you gain it popping back in the other, and I think that's what this uh, challenge is showcasing. Once I really got to, like, this is me trying to recreate some of the stuff that I discovered after I first beat it, so I'm intentionally putting myself in the danger sometimes, but uh, what I liked about this section is it looks like it's dangerous everywhere, but there's these tiny little, uh, there's like this internal window of opportunity that you can kind of sink into it has a very Meat Boy-esque jump right there, a diagonal jump with a saw blade hovering over you. So yeah, yeah uh, playing around this area a lot. And for almost every situation in this game where I felt frustrated that I had to wait the timer out, it's, there was usually like a, something else I could do to to get the party started, so to speak. Yeah, deciding which platforms to jump on and where is so difficult. Ooh, that was so close. That was so close. And the opportunities are just, they're surprisingly varied. It's so crazy. You know, they play around with a ton of different level and enemy elements too, which is another cool thing about this game. Uh, some games get by with a lot, or get do a, li a lot with a little, like the original Mario Brothers, or, you know, there's many platformers that are much more minimal than that, but this game has like, I don't know, a hundred unique elements and enemies. That's a lot. Unique platforming ch setups like this I've never seen before in games. Uh, even games that let you control your character, I've never seen this kind of stuff. And to get inside there, you have to wait till the purple drains and then wall jump and slide down these tiny gaps. <laughs> and not kill yourself, hopefully. Man, I love this game. <laughs> Killed myself, why? Some of these little falling uh, knife traps are a little cheap. Maybe the first time you play, you'll die, but you have an infinite lives, and you know, sometimes you're just gonna have to die <laughs> learning. Oh, I went in between those. Mm. All the people I like to talk to on Twitter. And some interesting neat fold and level design too where you go in one way you trigger a bunch of things and then you go out the other way like so many cool so many cool ideas expressed and very well executed in this game going after that last chair you have to go up and then fall down I think and let's see if I do it here. Up, oh, I didn't even do it. What a lazy player I am. Where's some, where are some really crazy endings? Oh, this one's pretty crazy. So these are two teleporters on the left and right side. And then you have th these orange platforms that go all the way up. And then they slam down with red, right? So 
you can see them going up when you're going up so you can kind of safely at least scout out the beginning part but then you got to have this crazy like action split right when they slam down and then you slowly use their platforms getting up without crushing yourself sonic style like that I almost got crushed and then you can so easily get crushed if you're not thinking ahead and it feels like there's so much going on but once you just get a basic feel for it you're like oh this is interesting like sure you're being forced to go left and right but as you can see, I'm making a ton of decisions. Jump, double jump, jump, double jump, jump, double jump, and I'm not sliding and I'm not waiting. You're like, just, you have a lot more control here than than you might think. So I'm gonna go ahead and and this is when I learned how to internally cycle. See that little drop technique right there? If you drop down a sliding block, you're completely safe. Like that, I'm doing it again. Now I'm just playing around to see how many other variations there are. And then once you realize, you know, that the difference between you dying a lot and not dying a lot, it's just a matter of <laughs> kind of understanding the the dynamics going on, then you realize there's a lot more room to play around in these, these challenges than it looked like. And instead of sitting down and memorizing what you think is the only, only way to go, you can actually have fun, like improvise like Mario. And it's a one button game on the iOS. <laughs> this one's neat because of timers. So like, this is complex timing. Notice how the little ones uh, desync or resync with the big ones. So you know this could be a case where it's irritating to wait, because who wants to wait extra cycles just because of the complex timer? And sometimes you get a good one, sometimes you don't. No, <laughs> like that. Let's see what I do. Yeah, that wasn't enough time. And now they're about to be synced, so I better be ready. There you go. Jump, jump. And then you go up the hole. And do the slide technique. Hey, uh. And see, I, got, I did that extra jump there because I was looking ahead. And then this game does such a good job of like, hey, it may seem a little hard to uh, understand what the skill is, but we're going to obviously introduce it early and then iterate on it so that if you were paying attention to how you should be learning, then you should definitely be able to pull it off on the later parts of these sort of longer gauntlets. Oh, is this a cool one? They're all cool. What's the trick question? Oh, I liked this one, and I like this one. So, you know, just take a peek at what this, this challenge is doing, and you ask yourself, like, have I ever seen any platformer do something like this before? And the answer is yes, a little bit. <laughs> Mario, one of the New Super Mario Bros. games has these sort of large swinging objects kind of like this. Um, but typically, like, not a lot of platformers can even pull this idea off giving you a controller, right? Uh, and this game does it so well with so so much less. And I like this challenge because the whole log uh, fortress, it's, just, it's a static challenge, and they put these bud saws in there, but, you know, you can just hang out in this and scout ahead as much as you want. I just thought this whole moving thing was neat and they could they could definitely um expand on this concept but i think the whole less is more uh conservative approach to these platformers i can't believe that the freaking log moved away at the exact rate i didn't need to need it to so this, this is just fun nope that's you dying now let me show this one. And there's there's so much variety. Each level element can add so many unique ideas. Uh, like this one, I think the platform falls when you touch it. <laughs> I went back in the hole and I still killed myself. But um, the platform falls when you touch it, so you need to get on and off. So, wow, get on the platform. 
looking ahead is a skill. Well, maybe the platforms, these don't fall then. So, okay, so you see these two platforms are in a static rhythm. Now the whole challenge of this final level, this final section of this level, is to, like I showed you before, break your head on the brick. But look how, look at that crazy technique. I just perfectly aimed at the hole I made and got out. And I need a version where I don't do that. Where is it? Oh, I don't have it? Well, that challenge is much harder if you don't do that. Because uh, every time you rebound down, you could die if you don't aim for one of the two platforms that are moving horizontally. And um, because the platforms are static below, you should be able to plan out pretty accurately if you're going to survive or not. And it was just a neat challenge. Oh, that one has ice. Well, there's hundreds of videos. Okay, so now we'll just take a, a slight detour from Leap Day. I wish I had saved more videos of Super Mario Run. Uh, first, I'll show you. Pause. Go back here. Ranked by series, 2D Mario. Super Mario Run is my sixth favorite Mario game of all time. At least so far on this list. And I played Super Mario Run. Where is it? Right here. 27 hours. A little iOS game, handheld, one touch, one or one finger game. Uh, 10 bucks, 27 hours. That means I platinum status did 2.7. Played it from 12:15 to I played it for a solid year. Uh, got some scores. Did some other stuff. This game is great. Uh, just like what I was explaining with Leap Day, Super Mario Run has an incredible legacy to live up to. You gotta feel like a Mario game. You need so many core elements like dynamic enemies, and you need um, you know clear feedback with the camera and the scrolling and, and you, your speed. You don't really get to control your speed in this game because you don't have a run button, but you gotta have something in there to give you some control. Variable height, uh, some secrets would be cool. This game doesn't really do much on the secrets, and the, uh, but you also need layered, sort of counterpoint style level design, and that's something I explained in other article series, and I probably touched on it on my Mario Fixer series. But level design in Mario needs to have sort of various possibilities tuned around various levels of skill and the moves that you make need to be reactive so that you emergently discover a lot of these possibilities when you are curious and playing naturally and going for coins and going for style oh wow I kill myself why did I do that and this game pulls it off in so many unique ways too like it has this single player level based campaign it has oh no I killed myself again it has um, a competitive head to head score attack mode and then it also has sort of a remix tin mode where it takes chunks of levels and kind of spits them back at you in these weird random orders and all these modes have different um, sort of objectives kind of like coin rush and new super mario brothers 2 was a way to remix its main levels and, and going for high score, so going for all the coins is a worthy challenge. It's kind of like what the secrets are like, um, kind of what fulfills that function. But look how look how non-linear this level is for an auto runner. Like, have you ever seen freaking Sonic's auto runner or uh, Bit Trip Runner or the crazy unicorn game? Like all these different auto runners. Like, have you ever seen them have a level design that looks anything like this? tiered and with powers and enemies and, and 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 level elements and you know daisy killing herself oops bleach why are you talking to me <laughs> from the past and the amount of precision that they pull off in this level design it's it's pretty crazy so like getting all the coins is hard enough 
uh, and getting them for all like how many levels? Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty-four, thirty-two, uh, about forty-five levels. That's already a challenge. But then going for high score and the competitive leaderboards, you know, I, I played this game so much more by friending people and looking at their scores and then thinking about how to get higher scores on these levels. It was very reminiscent of Coin Rush, which is why I love New Super Mario Bros. 2 and why I rate New Super Mario Bros. 2 so high. And this game has it. And it and it pulls it off extremely well. And I looked at some of the... Stuff like this is just hilarious. I'll show you. Daisy is the only character in the game with a double jump like this. When you have the star power-up, you get to run extra fast. So with this power-up to grab even more coins and points, I grab the star, skip the second jump, kill this guy for an extra two coins and wall jump back and then use her ability to hit the spring but if you don't have star you die like you cannot do that not only will you hit the enemy but even if you kill the enemy and run out of star you still die so like stuff like that layers possibilities stacked level design uh a really clever way to do um forward and back exploration of the level they give you three two or three balloons every stage and you can just tap the balloon to have your character float backwards and by doing so explore other paths and possibilities and try to get even more coins uh, or try to trigger things uh, in a necessary sequence so again for an auto runner for a game that makes you go forward uh, and for a game that's one button this game does so much with precisely tuned and highly varied and high level level design like other games just need to take note i wish i had more videos of super mario run uh leap day just so many videos of leap day but that's all right and you should even be in this check this playlist so let's see let's yeah i wonder if anyone's oh it's, people are chatting and i've been missing it see every time i miss your chats guys just like ping me on on discord or something <laughs> Oh, wow. Pac-Man comments. Yeah, Leap Day is free. I bought it because I didn't want to look at ads anymore, and obviously I paid it for 22 hours, so saving myself, like, hours and hours of ad viewing. <laughs> um, It's great. Mario Run's great. The only thing... Okay, so, like, random Mario Run comments and while we look at this Leap Day challenge right here. I thought the Remix 10 was going to listen to the, the sound in your iOS playlist and like change the level design to match the beats or something or change the tempo so you get nice slow levels when slow music or fast levels but you know no they didn't do it so that's all I can say but they even made Mario like oh look Mario and Toad are wearing headphones because you're listening to your own music because you know Nintendo doesn't really like to give you sound settings oh, this, this level is so cool the ice when you wall kick wall jump next to it you slide up at a high rate so you got to wait as late as possible but like i was saying nintendo doesn't really let you get the option to mute their game music so when you play mario you're always listening to mario you have no choice that's why i love smash brothers turning off the music playing my own music sometimes only listening to sound effects i think that's cool nintendo really doesn't like doing that so super mario realm is kind of unique in that aspect like hey you can finally listen to your own music you're like thanks nintendo cool leap day uh, so let's go back to our chart. So I was showing you a little bit of what I love about Leap Day. I explained a little bit of what I love about Super Mario Run. I've talked about Super Mario Run before, and it's Mario, so we don't need to over Mario ourselves on the stream. But the last thing is Celeste. And as you saw on my list, Celeste is like number 10. I'll just show you. Number 10 on my list of ranked by genre. But it's kind of like a trick because every single mario brothers game is in here <laughs> every single one period so like how many all 14 okay maybe not all 14 but a good chunk of those are just sitting here right at the top and then these so celeste is just like the 22nd favorite platformer um but i feel like celeste has a lot of issues and not just visual design issues not just uh camera and feedback issues but celeste and not just control issues and but pacing issues and fidelity issues, I guess that falls under feedback. Not not only in feedback, but it falls under some other categories. Uh, 
Okay, makes sense. I can go down here, it looks but like. Yeah. One thing I can say about Celeste's level design is you know, I love it is like not this, you know, very layered. <laughs> uh, there's that whole, like, those speed run techniques that you kind of learn late game and can really use to sort of move really quickly through these sections. You know, it has a, a, a tuning and a consideration for that. But otherwise, um, a lot of these challenges are poorly communicated and unfair in a lot of those ways. And, um, which is not too bad, right? Like, sure, in a game with infinite, um, infinite lives, dying a few times is never that big of a deal. Uh, but beyond that, the challenges are very linear. And in, in being tuned for such a strict uh, experience, I felt like the game was really just didn't allow for as much improvisation, as much uh, exploration as far as uh, the gameplay is concerned. And most importantly, you don't learn well banging your head against a strict linear experience. You learn better by having variable difficulty, and as you play, you adjust your own level according to what you feel you can take, and that better um, scaffolds your own learning experience so that you can actually learn. And the fact that people are ramming their heads so much against this, and the game sort of relishes in the fact that you die so much and tries to make you feel better about it, like all that, I feel like it's the wrong way to go about uh, designing these kinds of games. So, you know props for and I also feel like this game has too many levels uh, it just kind of overstays its welcome the whole less is more design rule of thumb or philosophy can be applied to you know how long your levels are how many elements you shove in the screen or how many out levels you shove in your game overall and this game just has so many levels and an A side and a B side and a C side and it's just all pretty much the same stuff like you have much less room to vary your gameplay challenges if you are linear you have much less room to cr create distinct and meaningful experiences if every challenge you go in like what one way do I have to beat this what one way do I have to go about this challenge and uh, and especially if you have sort of like uh, improper tools to learn it then you really are just a trial and error machine with that said this walkthrough doesn't even cover it. Some of my favorite areas in Celeste actually are um, the areas with those ghouls that follow you. And those ghouls are highly nonlinear and they react to the subtle changes in the way you play and they have a lot of interplay and you can throw things at them and bonk them in the head and get extra double jumps and kite them over and juke them and that's one of the most interesting parts of the game. Uh, so I wish I, I, the game had more of that and a little bit less of everything and, and um, and, and better tuning in certain areas, but you know, flashes of a lot of the same stuff that I like about Mario and Leap Day are in this game, just not enough of it <laughs> for considering so many other frustrations. But you know, that's the less. Uh, just wanted to comment on and compare those, those points and consider its linearity and how much more complexity a game like this has and how much. Um, how many more buttons it has access to and yet what its gameplay actually accomplishes is depends on whether or not it sticks close enough to the action core or not. We can always talk about more about that in the future but that's essentially what I wanted to go over. Um, the action core is about space, it's about positioning and even if you're making a fighting game or a brawling game or a racing game or a platforming game or just a game where you're Pac-Man and you're moving up, down, left, right, you gotta really um, understand what the spatial dynamics are and do a lot of sort of self-restraint in order to not mess with that, right? You got to keep your core intact. It's kind of like when you're cooking um, food with different ingredients. If you want to make a strawberry cake, you need to get good strawberries and then you need to not add freaking artificial strawberry flavor you need to not necessarily add strawberry candy which is artificial flavors in a different way and you need to not add like a bunch of other random fruit necessarily you need to not add a bunch of freaking sh sugar and corn syrup and uh, other kinds of things because the strawberry 
in and of itself is sweet and it has its own flavor and it's super nuanced and it can be super delicious and if you add too much you're actually taking away from the whole point of you making a strawberry cake or or trying to put strawberry flavor in your um cake in the first place i just picked strawberry because celeste and these stupid strawberries i see what you did to me celeste you have a picture of it right here grabbing a strawberry so yeah it, it just it's a <laughs> layered cake design <laughs> so it's like that with everything um and recognizing the core is super important looking at the games that do it well with so little a lot of people talked about subtractive game design i think that phrase is kind of stupid like everything you do in a game design has trade-offs and every decision you can make or can make is a push and pull of all these interconnected pieces so it's not like you build a full game out and then you just take a hatchet and you start chopping away stuff to subtract it you should be mindful of both elegant minimal and and sort of flourish stylistic or extraneous elements all the time there's no point in which you unless you have some weird development studio where you're like we made all this stuff and then you as a director just like and take that out take that out take that out maybe you could call that subtractive game design but i just call it design like if you want to hit a high target if you have a goal and you set your goals up properly for um as a designer and you can articulate what you want then it's called design you don't need any other weird phrase on top of that so that's all i really want to say looking at some platformers uh, there's a lot more we can talk about in terms of creating a criteria for what makes varied and good platforming gameplay but that's really beyond the scope of this video so i hope you guys enjoyed it tomorrow i'm definitely going to do the stream on stories and really get to story design um because that's just something a lot of people have questions on and it's kind of in my wheelhouse. It's kind of something I love to do and I love showing clips of TV shows and anime that kind of exhibit those ideas. So look forward to that. In the meantime, like us on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. Join us in the Discord if you want to talk to us and we will see you on the next episode of DL Live. <laughs>